Live from New York City, it's The Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I'm Gary Null. Nice to have you with us today. We begin our journey today by looking at health and healing. First comes a study that should concern everyone because it has a very positive outcome. And it's simply this. Think of all the people in Florida, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, California, states where you get a lot of sunlight. Well, you're more susceptible to different types of cancer. And here from the University of Eastern Finland comes a study that you're less likely to develop the deadly melanoma if you take vitamin D3. That's correct. Fewer cases of melanoma were observed among regular users of vitamin D3 supplements than non-users. They looked at 500 people who are susceptible to skin cancers. Skin cancers, you're talking about basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And they were tested at the uh, Kuopo University Hospital. What they found was simple. If you wanted less skin cancer, make sure you're getting your vitamin D3. It's that simple. Now, of course, we know vitamin D3 is important for our immune system. It helps us if we have colds or flu, but this is just one new finding. So we all want to have healthier skin. This helps do that. Another study up, and this is in the University of Otago, which is in New Zealand, diabetics, pre-diabetics, and that's about a, more or less 100 million people in the United States. Please pay attention to vitamin C. Research reported in the peer reviewed journal Nutrients show that low intake and serum levels of vitamin C may be particularly risky for adults with diabetes. The study analyzed 25,000 men and 26,000 women who participated in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey over a period of 19 years. And uh, what they found is that there was type 1 diabetics, type 2 diabetics, and at the beginning of the study, 38% of the people had an intake of vitamin C that was below the estimated average. And uh, it worsened to 46%, which means nearly half the people had less vitamin C than what their body required. Individuals whose intake of vitamin C was lower than what was recommended had a 20% higher risk of type 2 diabetes compared with an intake over what people should be taking. Now, these studies are using standards that I feel are grossly understated. Just ask any physician who uses vitamin C supplements, either in oral form or in intravenous form in their practice, and they'll tell you. They believe the average American, because their faulty diet, not having enough fruits and vegetables and antioxidants and fresh juices, like a fresh orange juice, are not suffering from classical scurvy, but are suffering from subclinical scurvy. And they see that in bleeding gums, loose teeth, and damaged skin aging prematurely, and loss of collagen in the skin, uh, which holds your skin tight, and therefore less, uh, less vitamin C and less quercetin, then the skin begins to sag. You get that jowy, baggy look. And also, you're more susceptible to colds and flu, and uh, your immune system is substantially compromised. You're more susceptible to cancer. So just think of how many people you know who may be obese. We got 20 million to 30 million children who are obese, and that's just a crime. We should never allow that to happen. I'll give you a little example of how misled you have been about the importance of supplements in your diet. At the very beginning of my career, I was only 21, and I had a chance to meet a man named Clinton Miller. Clinton Miller had been for a long time the voice of the National Health Federation. That was the one body in America that kind of challenged the FDA and medical doctors about them being overly, um, let's say, pessimistic about natural and healthy lifestyles. And so at that time, 
the average American, the average physician, remember, they smoked, they drank. They had ads in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I, I collected the ads, I put them in my documentaries showing doctors recommended you smoke Lucky Strikes or Camels or uh, Chesterfields. And always with the idea it was good for you, it would calm you down and you would feel better, you would breathe better. Of course, everything was just the opposite. As you just have to ask yourself, how many people died of emphysema, heart attacks, or lung cancer because they trusted their doctor till death? And it was not until all seven of the top C uh, chiefs of major tobacco companies lied under oath because they all said that there is nothing that they are aware of in cigarettes that can cause addiction or cancer. And because of that, up to that point, I'm not aware of any lawsuits that have been won by plaintiffs. So as a result, people just didn't sue the tobacco companies anymore because, well, it was scientifically proven there was no connection between a, your smoking and a disease until a whistleblower came forward and says, no, they've known all along, as has the FDA, as has the government known that it does cause addiction and it does cause cancer. And then they had to compensate the uh, state medical Medicaid boards for all the money that was spent at the state level for people who had diseases because of smoking. But people didn't stop smoking and they didn't, uh, they didn't ban tobacco, just had to put a black box warning. Now, why do I give you that? Because when I came into the field of health, first as a registered dietitian, then as a nutritionist, then as a board certified nutritionist, then as a PhD, a clinician in human nutrition and public health science, and then as a research scientist, junior, then a main, and then a research fellow, then senior research fellow, because my work, over 160 experiments in the Institute of Applied Biology, I began to see that everything we were told about health was wrong. I mean, just the opposite of what it should be. Remember when you're told margarine protects your heart and get rid of the uh, eggs and other things that are causing elevated cholesterol? But they were wrong about everything. They were wrong about the amount of fiber we should have in our diet. Five milligrams of fiber or five grams of fiber was considered a lot of fiber. No, it wasn't. 35 to 45 milligrams of fiber is how much you should have a day. So in other words, we were suffering a lot of diseases that were completely preventable if we had honest people administering different health agencies of government and in the industry, but we didn't. So there was an effort to ban all vitamins. And this was in the uh, late, to mid to late 1980s. And Clinton Miller came to me from the National Health Federation and he said, Gary, you're a scientist, you're a nutritionist. Can you find us scientific articles that we can use and go before Congress and try to stop or change this legislation because they're saying your vitamin is a drug. It isn't. And yet that was the game Big Pharma was playing because then if you had a need for a vitamin, you would have to first get a prescription from your doctor and then you'd pay an outrageous amount to get a vitamin, but the vitamin would be made by the Big Pharma, not your vitamin companies. So to my surprise, when I looked in the library of medicine and I just did it in alphabetical order, vitamin A, B1, B2, B6, folic acid, choline, inositol, panathenic acid, et cetera, B12, I found not a few articles in the purity literature in the library of medicine. I found hundreds of thousands. Vitamin C alone had about 40,000 articles at that time on its chemistry, uh, its usage, its potencies, and, uh, and I was just overwhelmed. So I collected all these over 500,000 articles and we gave it to him and then the, we gave it to a representative going overseas where they were trying to ban worldwide uh, ban vitamins, what was called Codex Elementarius. And the idea is with that, you unify everything, meaning so if Norway allows you to have one milligram 
of vitamin B1 and two and six, then every country in the world had to have one milligram. And that's what they were trying to do. It was, it was a brilliant program. Big Pharma was behind it all and corrupt politicians. So we made a presentation and I asked, could I speak before their, their committee uh, qualified in my scientific background? But more importantly, I had data they didn't know existed that the FDA said didn't exist and that it was in the National Library of Medicine. So then we went on a tour around the United States to almost 59 cities where I debated people on should you uh, legislate supplements? And we won. And it was called the Deshaies Amendment. So that stopped Big Pharma and the FDA from putting your supplements at tiny doses, 60 milligrams of vitamin C. When if you want to stay healthy, you have to have about a thousand milligrams a day, minimal. And then you have to have the right type because it's not all absorbed the same. And you should be able to get it from your food and as well as proper supplementation. And that's where we've been ever since. And we've been finding more and more supplements like now, L-carnitine, L-carnosine, NAD, PQQ, et cetera, are extremely beneficial for slowing down the aging process. And this is not based upon commercial exploitation of an idea to a vulnerable public. This is good quality science. Right now, there's probably 200,000 or more scientists in the United States who are studying the aging process and what can cause the uh, the stem cells to stay longer in the body and to rejuvenate. So we maintain our youth longer and there's research in telomeres research. And I'm a part of that. In fact, I've done five studies recently and I'm now about to start the sixth. And yet right now there's another effort to ban vitamins. Yeah, uh, by this Senator Durbin. And then just check the pharmaceutical company connections and lobbying and the money given to his campaigns, it's always been this way with Congress. They've been captured by big pharma. And that's why we still see high prices for drugs, drugs that have not shown efficacy or safety, and yet nothing happens to them. So once again, when it comes to consuming vitamin C, if we were told the truth, and if scientists who had worked with vitamin C were allowed to come forward on platforms and say, here's what we know about your vitamin C each day. Do you ever notice that you've got little splotchy blue uh, veins in your ankles, feet, and uh, varicosities, uh, bleeding gums, etc.? Do you find yourself coming down with one or two or three colds or flu per year? Well, you're probably deficient in vitamin C. And here's a simple yet inexpensive test you can take to determine how much you have in the cells and in your blood. Oh, and by the way, just one of the hundreds of different things vitamin C does, it traps free radicals and neutralizes them. And it loops many, many times through your body. But in trapping free radicals, the free radicals then cannot turn on inflammation in your joints. That helps you if you have arthritis or bursitis. Uh, or any of the inflammatory conditions like cancer, it can help turn it off. Now, if you take that vitamin C with lemon juice, it makes your blood slightly alkaline, and that can turn off a lot of acidosis, meaning a highly acidic body that is far more susceptible to pain and inflammation. Oh, and it also stimulates your natural killer cells. Those are the cells that 24 seven are going through your body finding cancer cells, engulfing them, and through a process called phagocytosis, dissolving them. Oh, and all those free radicals they're trapping can help your cells not be damaged, which means that the 10,000 gene alterations per cell per day are substantially negated, meaning your cells less likely to die earlier through senescence, programmed cell death. And there are a hundred other things vitamin C does. So what if we knew that? How many people then might be taking the right amount of vitamin C and from good sources? How many people might start having fresh squeezed orange juice each day? Use the juice of, let's say, five oranges to make a 12 to 16 ounce glass of juice, depending upon the oranges, because not all oranges give you a lot of juice. 
And then each day, throw in a juice from a lemon on top of that and a juice from a grapefruit on top of that. And you've got a super uh, good drink in the morning. Now, if each orange gives you about 60 to 90 milligrams of vitamin C, then right off the bat, your one glass of juice in the morning is giving you somewhere around five to 600 milligrams to start the day. That's a good start. Now, if you're sick, you might need a lot more. In fact, at the Institute of High Biology, where thousands of you came, and so many of you had your diseases reversed completely, including terminal diseases, we had the best results of any place I know of in the United States of reversing AIDS. In fact, we were the only place, only place in the world. And I go on the record with this. And we have absolute proof of it. I'd love to see Fauci or someone come and debate me on this issue because we had the patients. We have their medical records. We have all their blood chemistries. We have a whole team, 22 medical team, all board certified and top of their field, all willing to testify because they were the ones giving the treatment for my protocols over a 15 year period, 1200 of them, not one died. 18, it went on an advanced protocol with high dose vitamin C because that was the key. No one in American history had ever used 200,000 milligrams of vitamin C intravenous. We did. It changed the course of cancer and Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes 6, and AIDS, HIV. In fact, Linus Pauling and the head of Dr. Pauling's Institute, Dr. Jawala, we filmed him showing that quercetin by itself could destroy the HIV virus by itself. And vitamin C also destroyed it. All you have to do is get the right doses. And so we were titering them and doing their blood workups on a regular basis and, and people just got better and better. I'm talking about from death. I mean, they came in, they were near death and 16 to 18 months later, vitally healthy. So talk about being important and yet none of this information is shared with the average person. Why? Well, let's just throw this out. If you can help prevent a disease, how does that benefit the medical industrial complex, your local hospital, your local physicians. It doesn't. The money is not in prevention. The money is in treatment. So challenge everything you hear by the naysayers. You know, those very highly paid people that are so-called experts, and they never tell you about how conflicted these people are in their backgrounds. And they go on television and say, you don't need vitamin C. You know, once in a while, have an orange. Yeah, you do need vitamin C. And these people, unfortunately, are compromised. So remember, if you're a diabetic, you really need vitamin C. You also need exercise. You need a plant-based diet. You need to know which foods cause an increase in, uh, in the glucose levels. From Ohio State University comes a study about feeling depressed? Yeah, a lot of people are. And for pretty good reason today. Well, performing acts of kindness can help. Mm. I shared a story recently with you about the efforts to be kind to people and how you benefited from it. Well, this is a separate study. People suffering from symptoms of depression or anxiety may help heal themselves by doing good deeds for others. The study found that performing acts of kindness led to improvements not seen in two other therapeutic techniques used to treat depression or anxiety. Most importantly, the acts of kindness was the only intervention tested that helped people feel more connected to others. That's important. Here's what uh, Dr. David uh, Craig, the director of the study said, it says, Social connection is one of the ingredients of life most strongly associated with well-being. Performing acts of kindness seems to be one of the best ways to promote those connections. I would agree. The research also revealed why performing acts of kindness work so well. It helped people take their minds off their own depression and anxiety symptoms. This finding suggests that one's intuition and uh, that people use, hopefully, uh, can help them overcome their depression. Why? According to the study, they say that we often think that people with depression have enough to deal with. 
So we don't want to burden them by asking them to help others. But these results run contrary to that. Doing nice things for people and focusing on the needs of others may actually help people with depression and anxiety feel better about themselves. I think we all have seen that that is true in our life. We don't need a scientific study to tell us the kindness towards others, caring about others, caring about your community, caring about your family, even if there's you know, parts of your family that are really, as we all have had, you know, uh, somehow, it didn't make it up to the uh, level of, wow, I'm glad that we all learned this, is generally, what happened to Bob, Bill, Susan? Why'd they do that, say that? So what? Once again, acts of kindness can connect you with solutions to a problem. From the uh, Hemholtz Centrum uh, Research Center, Germany, selenium protects a specific type of, of interneurons in the brain. Yeah. Exactly 200 years ago, the Swedish scientist Verzulis discovered the trace element selenium, which he named after the goddess of the moon, selenium. Selenium is an essential trace element. You don't need much of it but it's indispensable for humans and animals and some bacteria. And here he found that, that this worked well on uh, the brain and the processing of the brain chemistry. Now we know it helps with cancer, 200 micrograms a day. It's a small amount, but it does work. So now it also helps protect neuron activity. Simple. Also, finally, from the Sun Yat-sen University in China, association of dietary carotenoids and intake with lower cognitive performance in older adults. So now that some people are living longer, which is good, and a lot of people living much longer, as many 10 years longer or more than Americans, the number of elderly people with cognitive decline has escalated because we're not all aging uh, with a healthy body and healthy brain and causing a burden for their families and governments. We all see that. And especially true of people who have to give up their own life in order to take care of someone in their family they love and feel more responsibility to help them. Now, if they're using holistic protocols, that's much better because I've seen how we can take a lot of the conditions that older people suffer from, memory loss, loss of cognition. Why am I in this room? Where did I put such and such? Those can be undone. You can literally de-age the brain by detoxifying it, helping the body to dissolve some of the amyloid plaque and stimulating a proper neuron activity, acetyl L-carnitine, phosphatidylcholine. Uh, we have a lot of different ways of helping that. But most people don't have awareness of that. So they're living longer lives. It doesn't mean they're happier or healthier. So what we have to understand is that, and this is what this university showed in this study, is that the carotenoids, not your fruits and vegetables, can change that. So if you start having people eat more fruits and more vegetables, it can delay cognitive function decline, and that's important, and that's what this found. That's how powerful these little nutrients, the carotenoids are. Also, make sure they're getting B12, and there's methylated B12, and that's one they should be taking, and methylated folic acid. The methylation reaction in the brain is positive. So vitamin A, the antioxidants, help your central nervous system, and uh, help prevent cognitive functional decline, but the carotenoids, the carotene uh, A and carotene, what is known as carotene one and carotene two, just uh, can help transform into retinol, which will be converted into a long chain fatty acid ester that is the main precursor to vitamin A in the human body. So the more vegetables you eat, the less neurocognitive decline. And how about juicing? By juicing, that really helps. All right, so make sure you get 
a lot of juicing. And by the way, for those of you still eating a lot of that fast food, University of Southern California just came up with a study that shows that consumption of fast food is linked to liver disease. You don't want to have liver disease. That's a tough one to overcome. And this was published in Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology. It just gives us a little more motivation to reduce fast food consumption. Ideally, no fast food consumption is the best fast food consumption. But if you start eating fast foods, you're going to end up with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in all likelihood. And that's a condition which builds fat up in the liver and that disrupts all forms of positive benefits. And diabetics especially are susceptible and that causes you to die younger. So get to the healthy diet, stay away from the junk food diet, all right? Stay away from the pizzas and all those fast food meals, high in protein that you don't need beyond a reasonable amount, and a lot of refined carbohydrates. So that's a lot of good information for today. And every Monday, You'll get all of the summary of the health information I share, always from library medicine, peer-reviewed journals, always done at respected institutions. Because for years, and I ask some people say, Gary, why do you cite the study and, and the institution? Because for years, there would be those called the quack busters who knew nothing about nutrition, had no background. In fact, in under oath, when they were testifying in a court uh, suit that was brought against them and they lost it, uh, which is good. Uh, what courses have you taken? What degrees do you have in clinical nutrition? None. Well, then what makes you an expert? How are you with no background in this field at all? How do you have uh, the ability to tell people who have PhDs and are clinical nutritionists that what they're doing is wrong? Have you done the research? Have you interviewed their patients? Have you seen before and after? Have you seen all the patients whose diseases were reversed using lifestyle modification? No. So you're simply saying that anyone who practices holistic health care in the United States is practicing quackery? Yes. And that's based upon your opinion. But they have hundreds of thousands of studies showing that what they're giving is real science. And you have zero real science on your side. So now, every single thing I do, I cite the science. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to change anyone's mind. We know how close-minded a lot of people are, especially professionals. But it's left to those of you who have an open mind and want to know, is this just your opinion? Or is there something more backing up what you're saying? It's always based on a lot of good quality information. There's one documentary you should see if you want to see how, how corrupt science is. No, not my newest one, uh, Science for Hire, but the one just before it came out last year. The cost of denial. What happens when we deny real science and instead give you political pseudoscience? And you see the people who reverse their A's by using real science. All of this denied by Fauci's group. Anyhow, we're going to take a break because we have a lot more to share with you. But on Mondays, if you go to GaryNall.com and subscribe uh, free to that Monday newsletter, you'll get this. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we also have a newsletter with a lot more information in it. <clears throat> And there's a very tiny cost for that. But at least you know where you can go to get quality information. Back in a moment. Please stay with us. On the programming, we'll look no further than PRN.live, the home for progressive voices.